All right, so like I said, we're out here with fisheries biologist here, Johnny Ward. Now, um, partly because we're old friends with Johnny Ward, uh, but also because it's really important that, 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 that some of the fish we're chasing today are unique. The char is very unique, Arctic char. How unique are they for, for folks that aren't familiar? They're so unique that this is the only place in the entire lower 48 states that you can catch one outside of the state of Maine. Outside of the state of Maine. So it's a very, very unique fish. And the reason that you and other biologists have put them in here over the years is because this fishery mimics other fisheries. What's the... Yeah, actually, it's most similar to some lakes in Scandinavia that have Arctic char and mysis shrimp. That's kind of the system that we're working with. We got a lot of mysis, and uh, so Arctic char was kind of a natural uh, choice. Gotcha. And a mysis shrimp, for folks who aren't familiar, is a little, what, half inch on the outside long shrimp. Yeah, about. Yeah. Lives below the thermocline most of the time mm -hmm. and basically cleans the water column to the point of sterility to, to, for all intents and purposes. Yeah, and that's a challenge with them. They eat zooplankton, which, you know, we've got kokanee, which are filter feeders on zooplankton too, so they're a competitor. Gotcha. Can so, be. But the kokanee salmon will also eat the shrimp at times as well is that correct if not? they're in the same place in the lake they will um but the problem is they tend to not be in the same point in the water column for very much time oh uh, gotcha okay so that's the problem with with mysis wherever they occur is that they don't cross paths with fish very often unless they get dumped out the dam and end up in the river at right. which point the trout can eat them by the jillions exactly gotcha yeah. that makes sense so uh these char We've seen relatively small versions today. Mm -hmm. They get bigger. How big yeah. do you think in the long run is the goal to get them in here? Well, if we could get them up to four to six pounds, that would be fantastic. That's That would be the ultimate goal. Four to six pounder. Now, that'd be a serious fish. Now, for folks that aren't familiar with them, like myself, I had never even seen one till today. Uh, in like October, they turn this incredible red, or at least the males do, this incredible red color. Um, that's just you got to see it to believe it i mean they just don't even look real and now these fish are all bleached out and kind of kind of yeah. post spawn coloration now these are fall spawners i assume Greg. yes you know, all char fall yep. spawners. Yep. yep okay that's what i thought now guys that are regular viewers of the show will also recognize john was on with us once before when we did a kokanee salmon fishing show over in wolford reservoir and uh which is another reservoir that you deal with on a regular basis now kokanee salmon it's actually a landlocked sockeye mm -hmm. it's a sockeye salmon like folks might be familiar with from from alaska uh they're a landlocked version why are they so important to stock in colorado reservoirs because they eat plankton which our reservoirs are good at producing and they convert plankton into fish flesh and then they can either act as a sport fish or as a prey base and if things are going well, then they can be both. They, they can be both. So effectively, it's like this. A lion cannot eat the grass on the Serengeti, but the gazelle can eat the grass, and the lion can eat the gazelle. So without the gazelle, there is no lion in some cases. So these fisheries would be very close to sterile in some ways if it wasn't for the kokanee salmon that do a good job of eating plankton and therefore making food for other species, the most famous of which is, of course, the lake trout. Yep. Hmm. And... I, I also compare them to gizzard shad in, in warm water reservoirs. They kind of serve the same function uh, in, as, as far as a prey based thing go, because gizzard shad are plankton eaters. But they don't give you the support, the, uh, the sport fish, I should say, that the cokes give you for sure. Now, cokes exactly. are delicious to eat as well. Uh, now, this is a catch and release situation for the char because we're trying to get them established. But uh, if they were to be established and a size limit or something would be put on them, they would be edible fish at some point? Sure. Yeah. And well, some of them, there's definitely good edible sizes now, but we do have a regulation going into effect on April 1st of 2015 that will be uh, 20, one fish over 20 inches is what you can keep. We're going a pretty conservative regulation sure. for a little while till we can see uh, what this population is going to do. Right. And, and you think that they'll do okay as far as self-recruitment in here in the long run? Yeah, that's the goal. And we know from uh, Devin Olson's master's thesis that uh, he just completed on these char, at least 30% of the fish in the lake right now were born in the lake. Okay. So, so there is reproduction going on. Huh. It's a unique fish, that's for sure. And, uh, you know, I'd love to, to catch them in the fall in the open water just to see what they look like at that time of year. But now they don't, they live through their spawning, unlike the kokanee salmon. The kokanee salmon operations yeah. that you oversee, um, basically they live three years. Right, they, three or four. You put them in a fishery. They live three to four years, mm -hmm. and they all come back to where you stock them. Mm -hmm. You can recatch them, and artificially uh, spawn them, and yeah. then stock them wherever you need. So most of your 
fish that we catch, as far as the cokes go, are caught at just a few reservoirs, and then they're mm -hmm. stocked all around the state. Right. Hmm. And actually, one of the unique things about Dillon is that the, the kokanee in Dillon have been self-sustaining since uh, nine, it's been over 30 years oh, really? that these uh, cokes have sustained themselves, and we haven't stocked a single kokanee in Dillon. Really? Yeah. Okay, that's interesting to know. It's there's not very many places in the state like that, right? And what I think a lot of people lose sight of, and, and why I try to fish with the biologists that manage various bodies of water all the time. One thing about the Western United States is you're dealing with giant fish tanks. We don't have natural lakes. We don't have, um, you know, some of the fertility that you have in a natural lake that you'd find back east somewhere. We're dealing with a with a giant fish tank. There's almost no native species in any of these lakes. What white suckers, sculpins. White suckers aren't even native to the west slope. Oh, they're just not. Just the east slope. Okay, so there's, I mean, there's really no native species in here. So it's up to biologists to create and balance all the time a fishery. And that's a very dynamic thing to do when you have a lot of things out of your control, like, say, water levels or water quality, things that you can't, as a biologist, control. Um, you only have so many ways to control a population of fish. And one of those is through through fishing and, and recruitment that way or, or uh uh, culling of that way and then and the others through stocking so it's a it's a balancing act i know that